So let's get to our next guest, Christina Brundage, who is a very active member of our hypersomnia community. Since being diagnosed with IHN in 2018, she has participated in three different drug study uh, drug trials, and she's added her information to the CORES registry. She joined the Young Adult Representatives of Rare Disease Legislative Advocates and is constantly looking for ways to help the rare disease community. So when she's not sleeping, she enjoys spending time with her husband and two dogs, reading and watching Netflix in bed. So let's hear from Christina. <laughs> um, hi, like Rebecca said, uh, I am Christina Brundage. I'm very honored to be here today, and I'm so happy that everyone is here to learn more about hypersomnia research. Um, for as long as I can remember, I've always been tired. I never really thought much of it. I thought I was just excellent at sleeping. Growing up, I would fall asleep on the bus every morning and afternoon. I would fall asleep in class. I would take naps when I got home. And during the summers, I would usually wake up at around 5 o'clock p.m. when my mom got home from work. In college, I would often sleep through classes, and I actually made my class schedules around when I could take naps. Um, I've fallen asleep in restaurants, on the concrete outside of airports, standing up, talking to people, during ballets, and several times on the back of motorcycles. I have had about 30 alarms set on my phone and three alarms throughout my room and most days I would still sleep through them. Still, I thought it was normal. I didn't see or I, I really didn't see want to see that I had a problem. It wasn't until a visit in 2018 with a new dentist that I started to think differently. Uh, when I got there, he started asking me a lot of questions about my sleep and how I felt throughout the day. I told him that I never felt rested and I was always tired. When he looked at my mouth, he noticed that I had larger tonsils from chronic strep infections as a child. He mentioned that I could possibly have sleep apnea and he told me to look into getting my tonsils removed. This kind of made me hesitate. Um, if you may know, tonsillectomies as an adult can be really, really hard to get through. Uh, so instead, I went to see a sleep doctor to inquire about a sleep study. When he ordered the study, he told me that he was going to add in an MSLT to check for narcolepsy. Later on, when I was telling my family, I actually laughed at the idea. I thought there was no way that I had narcolepsy or anything close to it. Honestly, the only thing I knew about narcolepsy was Rowan Atkinson's character back in Rat Race. It's a really old movie. <laughs> When the doctor came in to tell me my results, I was pretty shocked and confused. I had never heard of idiopathic hypersomnia and the doctor didn't give me much information either. He just gave me armadafinil and told me to come back in six months. When I left the office, I started doing my own research. Um, I found the Hypersomnia Foundation and through them the Cords Registry. I immediately added my information in because I wanted all information about any future stud study trials. A month or so later, I had actually started trying to contact my sleep doctor because I wasn't feeling any different from the medication they gave me. Unfortunately, they did never return my calls or emails, and because of the lack of communication, I decided it was time to find a new provider. Previously, in, with my hypersomnia research, I found on the Hypersomnia Foundation page, um, they have a healthcare provider directory. So I went back there and I found my current doctor, Dr. Bogan with Bogan Sleep Consultants. At basically that same time, I got an email from the CORDS registry telling me about a clinical trial that was looking for participants. I sent in my information and surprisingly enough, I got an email from the research coordinator at Bogan Sleep Consultants, the same place I was about to have a new patient appointment at. The day I went in for my appointment, Dr. Bogan was night and day from my previous doctor. He must have spent over an hour talking to me and explaining to me everything there is to know about hypersomnia. And he made sure that at the end of the appointment, I had absolutely no questions about anything. After we were done, the research coordinator came in to give me the information about the clinical trial. I was really nervous. Um, I had never done anything like this before. My dad was even more nervous. And he told me that he didn't think that I should do the trial 
because he said there really wasn't any guarantee that it was safe, but I'll talk more about that later. I thought long and hard on it, and ultimately I decided that this was something I needed to do. I'm not capable of doing research to help myself out or my fellow IHers, um, but I am definitely capable of participating in research because without participants, as you've seen, the research, it can't be done. Ultimately, I have participated in three different trials. Um, everybody's experience will be different. What I felt may not be the same for you, um, but I can tell you about how it was for me. All of the studies I took in, uh, part in, were double blind placebo controlled crossover studies, which I've been told is the golden standard. Um, this means that there are two stages for them. I was guaranteed to get the real medication during one of the stages, and then I was going to get a placebo for the other part. I'm almost positive during all three trials that I knew which one was the placebo versus the real medication, because there were times that I was definitely less exhausted. Um, or times that I was very definitely awake. Um, like I wasn't tired at all. The studies were all different in some ways. Uh, the worst part of them though were the sleep diaries. Um, for one of the trials, I had to put information into a cell phone uh, that they gave me. And I had to put it in twice a day about how I slept, when I slept, if I took naps and how I felt throughout the whole day. This was during and before, before and during the trial, mostly. I'm really bad at remembering to do things. Um, so it was also on a timer. So if I waited too late or if I slept in too late, I wouldn't be able to put my information in. And for this particular study, if that happened too often, there was a chance that they would kick me out. So the research coordinator actually stayed on top of me to make sure I was getting my information in most days. For some of the studies, I had to go into the clinic several times for overnight studies and maintenance of wakefulness tests, which is where you sit in a dark room and try to stay awake. It's pretty hard for hypersomnia. <laughs> in the first study, I fell asleep quickly during the uh, MWTs during both phases. Um, other than still being sleepy, but not as exhausted, I had no other effects from the medication. Um, it was a really, really good experience and I was excited to be able to start another clinical trial. But uh, for this particular, for the next one, I did have to wait three months in between. In the spring of 2019, the time came for me to be able to start the next clinical trial. I was really ready because I was excited to see how I re would react to this one versus the previous one. Because this st study was in its later stage, I didn't have to go in and do overnight testing. I just had to go to the clinic several times to tell them how I was feeling, get a, clinic, uh, get a physical done, and to increase my dosage. I did have some trouble with this trial. Uh, mostly it was from the side effects. Even though I did have side effects though, I was very awake um, and I felt pretty good. I think if I wouldn't have had the side effects that I did, um, it definitely would have been the medication for me. In the end though, with this study, I terminated early. Um, I ended up having to go on a two week overseas trip. So that's the main reason why I did. Um, terminating early made me really, really nervous. Um, I was afraid that even though sleep clinics aren't supposed to, um, that they wouldn't invite me back for new studies. Uh, of course, as I found out, there shouldn't be any anxiety with terminating early. My research coordinator was amazing. She reassured me several times that they would not hold it against me and they would honor any choice that I made. In early 2020, she sent me an email about another clinical study. This would be my third. Because of the pandemic, I wasn't able to start this third clinical study until August of 2020. The screening period was fairly easy. It had the best sleep diary of all because it was just a piece of paper that I had to fill out for a week. Um, it, I was more nervous for this one because it was in an early study phase um, and they had a lot of different qualifiers. Uh, the biggest qualifier I had to get through was my BMI. Unfortunately, during the quarantine, I gained a significant amount of weight. Um, so I was slightly above the BMI that they wanted me to be at. Uh, I did end up changing my eating habits and I slid right underneath uh, where they wanted me to be. I was also a little concerned because they required you to be in the sleep lab for a long time, but luckily I spoke with my job and they allowed me to work from home. So I was able to work during the study. 
the first stage of this study, I knew that either A, I had received the placebo or B, the medication just didn't work for me. Uh, while I was in the lab, I was counting down the times for the MWTs because I was so tired, I just wanted to sleep. During the second stage of the study, I felt awake almost immediately after taking the medication. I was slightly nauseous at first, but that day I had also eaten hospital breakfast food and I'm willing to bet that it was because of that. The first uh, MW came, MWT came and I was not tired at all. I just stared at the wall the whole time, not moving because you're not allowed to. Um, and so during that second stage, I was actually dreading the MWT because I knew I'd be sitting bored. I really wasn't tired the entire time. I don't think I even yawned once during that second stage. My mind felt awake and my body felt awake. It was truly amazing and something I had never felt before. All in all, I am so incredibly happy that I've had these opportunities because now I really know what works for me and what to look for in the market uh, when these medications ultimately get approved. Earlier, uh, when I had said my dad was nervous about my safety, uh, I found throughout each study, I never felt unsafe or taken advantage of. The doctors and research coordinator were there for me every step of the way and to answer any questions I may have had. And I had a lot and I emailed them a lot. Um, as far as safety, I feel like these trials are incredibly safe, especially the later phases, because you know people have already been through them. Of course, you have to do what you, are, you feel comfortable with, uh, but I think studies are a very worthwhile thing to do, not only because you can be benefiting yourself, but you're also helping others with your same condition. In addition, many of the studies will actually compensate you for your time and sometimes your travel, since the sponsors recognize that you are giving up some of your life and sometimes your finances, to, if you have to take time off of work, to participate in these trials. Uh, while my main goal is to further hypersomnia research and find better hypersomnia treatments, I still appreciate that the sponsors recognize that my time and my energy are important and valuable. I will continue to participate in trials until they tell me to stop. I am the perfect age range and I'm not planning on having children anytime soon, so I don't have to worry about pregnancy. Yeah. Um, but if you are interested in participating in a study, I highly, highly recommend you go to a sponsor clinic and at least get information about it. All right, Christina, thank you so much for all of your stories and all of your work to help find new cures for idiopathic hypersomnia and related sleep disorders. We do have a couple of people that have submitted some questions. Um, so one is, have any of the trials where the medication you felt might be helpful to you offered you options for continuing the medication after the trial? So um, the second one I did, they did offer it, um, but I had terminated, er terminated early, so I didn't get that chance to take it afterwards. Um, the other two were too early in their um, stages for them to be able to offer it. Okay. All right. Super. Um, and then another question would be, um, it's a little bit more about your experience um, having idiopathic hypersomnia because it's not really a household name like narcolepsy is. So the question is, do you have some advice for how to deal with educating those around you like close friends and family or maybe even employers? Um, so to, to help them understand what idiopathic hypersomnia is and how it affects you? Yeah, um, so luckily for me, I don't think I've ever ran into an issue with um, educating. I think it's because I'm bossy. So uh, when I tell people something, they don't, I think they're afraid to question anything that I say. Um, but <laughs> for me, I, I kind of start out, um, I let people know, hey, I have hypers I do have like hypersomnia and it's a cousin of narcolepsy. Um, so they kind of get in their mind, okay, well, I, I might not know what narcolepsy is. So this is something that's close to it. Um, and then I kind of go into explaining, um, I say, no matter how, how much sleep I get, I'm always tired. So I can sleep for an entire day and then I'll still feel like I haven't slept. Um, and I think that kind of helps me, like helps other people I know under, kind of understand um, where I'm coming from. Um, so those are kind of my two things that I say, uh, okay. I mean, and I think you really have to um, figure out what's best, like with who you're talking to. Um, 
and the, I do know the Hypersomnia Foundation has some pretty good um, information as well for talking with people. So. Yeah, so there's a couple of questions um, asking about uh, kind of who is allowed to participate in clinical trials and, and what are some criteria that kind of you, you can't often participate in trials. I don't know how familiar you became with the requirements for these trials. Like if you're of older age, can you participate? And if you know it, let me know. And if you don't really know it, um, we, we probably have some other ways of figuring out this, these, the answers to these questions. Um, well, I do know it, it depends. Um, different trials have different criteria. Um, so sometimes they are from like, it, it, I, they're usually 18 and up. Um, and then uh, there is a cutoff for age and it just depends on the trial. Um, I have seen a lot of trials won't let you, if you have some other type of um, sleep, say you have restless leg syndrome, they won't let you participate. Um, so they really want you to just have a hypersomnia diagnosis. Um, and as a woman, as a young woman, um, birth control is a big thing as well. Um, so I have the arm implant for my birth control, but um, if you have different things or if you're not on it, sometimes they also won't let you participate because they want to make sure that you're not going to get pregnant during the trial. Super. Well, on our clinical trials webpage on the hypersomnifoundation.org website, uh, there is a page that lists open trials. Lots of times there's a link to a web page describing the trial and sometimes there will be information about who is eligible. And there's always somebody to contact and ask the questions about whether or not you think you would be able to participate. So I encourage people to use that website and uh, research what's out there. Thank you, Christina, so much for sharing your personal story and for your continued work to um, do clinical trials so that the rest of us can hopefully get some medications uh, eventually approved through the FDA. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having yes. us.